Good evening, ghoulies and ghosties and long-leggedy beasties. This is Alex, coming at you from the underworld, and welcome back to another episode of... Before I get started on this weekend's book review, I would just like to wish all of my Jewish friends and viewers a happy Hanukkah. Also, I understand that due to coronavirus, we're not going to be able to celebrate the way we normally do. So because of that, I'm just grateful that we can connect, especially online. I brought you a cup of good cheer. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. That's so sweet of you. I know. Mmm, my favorite eggnog. I know. Mmm. Drink it all up. This weekend, I'm reviewing Krampus by Brahm, which I recently read for the second time, and upon doing so, I enjoyed it more than before. Now, don't get me wrong, I really did love this book the first time I read it, it's just that between then and now, I had had a few things happen to me where I could appreciate the characters a great deal more. So, that was pretty cool. And before I get into the synopsis, I would like to bring attention to two different subjects. The first one is, Krampus is available in print, ebook, and audiobook, but because of the beautiful artwork that's inside of this, I would highly recommend getting a hard copy or the ebook edition. And the second topic I want to touch on is, I've noticed where some people who had never read this book before have questioned if this was the book that inspired the 2015 movie Krampus. And no, it isn't. That movie and this book are two completely different things. And both of them are great, but just don't expect to read this book and gain from it what you saw in the movie, because that's just two different things. So, without me needing to add anything more for this segment, let's go in and find out what happens when Krampus comes to town. Krampus by Brahm is about a struggling musician named Jesse, which he happens to be at the end of his rope because his music has yet to take off and his wife has taken their daughter and left him for another man. So, as Jesse is considering suicide this Christmas Eve, he becomes distracted when he sees a group of Bell Snickles chasing Santa Claus down the street. And as he continues to watch, he sees where Santa and his sleigh lift off, but not before the Bell Snickles jump aboard. And as the struggle continues, Santa's sack of toys fall from the sleigh and crash through the rooftop of Jesse's house. Which Jesse soon discovers this is no ordinary sack of toys because it can manifest objects. And while he thinks that his luck has changed for the better, he discovers this is the very sack that Krampus and Santa have been fighting over for the last 500 plus years. So from here, Jesse becomes confronted by Krampus and he's met with a wager, which this is, if Jesse helps Krampus kill Santa Claus, then Krampus will kill the men who intend to harm Jesse's unsuspecting wife and daughter. So without nothing left to lose, Jesse joins Krampus and the Bellsnickel so they can resurrect the ancient traditions of Yule and save his family. In the author's note, Brahm said he learned about Krampus from his wife where he became fascinated by the subject. Once intrigued, he browsed vintage greeting cards on the iconic figure where he noticed some images of Krampus were accompanied by St. Nicholas. It was this imagery that made him ponder what Santa thought about Krampus and what may have been their relationship. Also, this posed a question that would serve for the basis of Brahm's novel, which was, who would win in a fight between Krampus and Santa? Fun facts. Here's a few things you might not know about Krampus. In his notes, Brahm said, although there are multiple stories regarding Krampus, it was revealed the existence of Krampus and winter solstice date back long before the birth of Christ and Santa. During these olden times, the holiday known as Yule was honored where practitioners celebrated the rebirth of Mother Earth. And with that holiday came the Yule Goat, which is one of the first manifestations of Krampus. 
For pagans, Krampus represented nature, fertility, and the change of the seasons. Also, he was said to chase away evil spirits and to assure a bountiful growing season. While this lore came from Germany and Austria, it spread throughout Europe. Yet once Christianity came, Krampus and many other horned deities were labeled as demons or devils. From here, the church abolished these old ways and morphed them into Christmas traditions, like bringing in the evergreens and leaving gifts and socks or boots. It is noted the real Saint Nicholas died in 342 AD, and he was the first modern depiction of Santa. Yet he wasn't cantonized until the 800s when Christmas became an established holiday. And as he gained widespread notice in the 1200s, Krampus eventually became known as the Christmas Devil or the Slave of St. Nicholas. Now that we have that covered, it's time to move on to the spoiler section, which, if you haven't read this book before, I'm going to reveal some things that could ruin the experience for you. So if you wish to skip this, all you have to do is scroll down to the comments, and you'll see that I have a pinned comment at the top with a timestamp in it. Once you click this timestamp, it will direct you away from the spoilers and to the thoughts chapter. Now, you only have 17 seconds to do this, so ready, set, go! Since everyone's had the opportunity to click away, I'd like to talk about a few of my favorite moments, which the first one that comes to mind is the epic bloodbath that occurs at the General's Garage. Now, prior to this, Jesse had used Loki's magical sack so he could take the General's stash from his safe, but eventually he gets caught and is brought to the General's Garage where he's tied down to a chair. And this is when the General explains to him, if he tells the truth, he will have a quick and painless death. Otherwise, if the general thinks he's lying, then he's going to get tortured. Well, because of the truth sounding as far-fetched as what it does, the general automatically thinks that Jesse is lying to him, so the torture begins. But midway into the torture, Jesse is able to convince the general to go get the magical sack so he can demonstrate how it works. Well, as Jesse has his hand down in the sack with the intention to pull out a gun, the General's two henchmen, who are Chet and Ash, end up messing Jesse up pretty bad. And after this happens, the General starts inspecting the sack and he puts his hand down into it, which this is when Krampus grabs him and pulls himself out into the garage and he slashes up Chet, he yanks out Ash's heart, then as the General is trying to get away, he slips and falls in a puddle of guts and blood. Which, I honestly thought that Krampus was going to kill Chet and the General, but with him turning them into Bell Snickles, that was also pretty suitable. Now, the things that I like about this moment are that the instruments of torture were, like, really intimidating. I honestly thought that we were going to get some really sick crap that went down here. Then I really appreciated how it felt when Krampus rose up out of the sack because he presented himself as a force not to be reckoned with. And even though this scene didn't have a lot of guts and gore in it, it was still enough to quench my thirst for blood. Now, the second moment that I really enjoyed is oddly not intense or gory. As a matter of fact, it's actually pretty whimsical, and I wish I could have been there, which this is the moment where Krampus and the Bell Snickles go into Horton's bar. And when they first go in there, Horton thinks that they're thieves with the intent to rob them. But when he discovers that their intent is to buy the bar for the night and buy drinks for everyone, suddenly this becomes a huge celebration. And earlier in the story, we discover that Jesse has lost faith in himself because his music career hasn't taken off. Well, Krampus is the kind of entity where he really encourages people to not give up on their dreams and to pursue what makes them happy. So he talks Jesse into getting on stage and performing. And even though Jesse has little faith in himself, Krampus is able to give him the courage to play his ass off. And while he's like playing heart and soul, Jesse ends up connecting with Mother Earth and he starts receiving these visions of nature and of all of these like whimsical creatures that are dancing with the animals. And it's just a very, very fun scene. 
And come the next day, Jesse and all of them go outside and they see where the ice and snow has melted away from the bar and all of the woodland creatures have gathered in harmony, which I love this scene for many reasons. One is because of the imagery, but the main reason why is because we see where an artist has regained faith in himself. And this really spoke to me on a deep level because I've had some very negative experiences with publishers, and it's to the point where I did lose faith in myself. So to regain that faith is something that just really touches my heart. Now, the final moment that I really enjoyed was when Dillard finally got his comeuppance. And what happens here is Jesse goes to Dillard's place to save his wife and child. And Jesse and Dillard get in this kick-ass fight where Jesse gets this sleeping sand and throws it in Dillard's face and knocks him the hell out. Well, when Dillard wakes up, he's being held at gunpoint by Jesse, and he's being forced to wiggle into the magical sack, which Dillard doesn't understand that the sack is magical. So he starts wiggling into it, and he begins to freak out when he can't feel the ground under him. So before he can get out of the sack, Jesse runs over to him and shoves him down in there, but he's like holding Dillard by the neck, so he's like just dangling in space. And this is when we start to hear like all of these screams and cries that come up from the sack, which of course are the lost souls from hell. And he lets Dillard freak out about this for a moment, then he just shoves him on down in there, and Dillard falls into his eternity, which this is going to be a very horrible death. And it's really suitable for him because Dillard does some really shitty stuff throughout this book. Y'all, I would like to use this opportunity to talk about that worthless piece of shit who is known as Dillard. Now, in a nutshell, Dillard is a two-timing misogynistic bastard who doesn't do a single good thing throughout the entirety of this book. I mean, check it. This yeast-infected broken vibrator killed his first wife. He talks about Linda like she's a piece of meat. And when he's backed into a corner, he abuses Linda and Abigail. Also, add on top of that that he's a crooked cop, he does bribes, and he also does blackmail. So when the son of a bitch finally went to hell, I was like, this is pretty cool. He's going to be wandering around those catacombs with the rest of the lost souls until he starves to death. And at the end of the day, I felt that was pretty frickin' poetic. I loved Krampus because of its complex characters, the author's research, and even some of its philosophy. Like, character-wise, Krampus really provides us with a cast of colorful personalities, and among those, Santa and Krampus stand out the most. Which, at the beginning of this book, Krampus tells us his side of the story, and eventually I was like, okay, Santa deserves to die because he's evil. Then when I got Santa's backstory, I was like, okay, well, neither Krampus or Santa are evil. As a matter of fact, they share the common goal where they want to help humanity. It's just that they have different ways of doing this. Like, for example, Santa believes that by sharing good cheer and charity, he's going to raise the spirits of humankind so they can avoid going to hell in the afterlife. Whereas Krampus believes people should celebrate, they should pursue their dreams, they should connect with Mother Earth and live to the fullest of their ability. And while they're doing this, he's chasing away evil spirits and punishing the wrongdoers. So, yeah, neither of them are evil. As a matter of fact, it feels like Krampus and Santa are going through a nasty divorce, and we as human beings are just caught up in the middle of it. So, that was pretty interesting. Now... As far as the author's research is concerned, I'm not a huge fan of fantasy or mythology, but I do enjoy those subjects in small doses. And because of the author blending the subjects as well as what he does, I was really able to enjoy how Santa and Krampus had the backstory of Norse mythology. And due to the detail that the author puts here, I could tell he did his research. Now, as far as philosophy goes, this book does have a lot of different religious philosophies to it, but none of them are preachy, thank God. 
And I could go on and on about the different philosophies that this book presents, but I would rather just talk about one moment that really stood out to me. And this is when Krampus and a reverend are having an argument, and the reverend assumes that Krampus wants him to give up Christianity. And this kind of confuses Krampus because he's like, what? No, I don't want you to give up Christianity. I'm not asking you to give up anything. All I'm asking is that you find it within your heart to accept other gods that exist. I'm not asking you to just abandon your beliefs. Just accept us. And this was something that really spoke to me because it really made me feel like Krampus wasn't trying to rob this man of any of his beliefs. He was just asking for acceptance, and that really just touched my heart. And I could go on and on about that subject, but instead, I'm just going to go in and close out this segment and say that the book didn't scare me, it didn't creep me out, but it did put me in the spirit of the season, and I could not put it down. Krampus by Brahm is the type of book that feels like it caters to a wide audience. And what I mean by that is, if you want to read the book as a horror book, you can totally do that. But also at the same time, if you prefer fantasy over horror, then yes, you can read this as nothing more than fantasy. And if you're looking for a book that focuses on like a celebrity deathmatch while you're getting some mythological history and some really strong characters while set during the holiday season, this is totally the book for you. And I do highly recommend Krampus, especially during this time of year. On to the questions. My first question is, what is a horror book you would recommend about Santa or Krampus? Load up the comments. My second question is, what is one of your yearly holiday traditions? Personally, as far as myself, when I was a kid, my parents and I would ride around and we would look at decorated houses and all of the Christmas lights, and we would do this while listening to Christmas music. So because of COVID having an effect on so many things this year, this is actually a tradition that Carrie and I are still going to be able to do, which we plan to do this maybe next week. So we're really looking forward to being able to just have some quality time together and ride around looking at Christmas lights while listening to Christmas music and also having like some hot chocolate and snacks. So yeah, we're totally looking forward to that. But be sure to load up my comments on what you do because I would love to know what some of your traditions are. And with that said, it's now time to move on to this weekend's meme, which if you would like to participate in next weekend's meme, all you have to do is befriend me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And whenever I post an image asking for you to caption it, all you have to do is leave a caption and the best one will show up here. This weekend, I chose the caption by Joey Brown from Facebook, which is, I love the smell of whiskey. I mean, coffee in the morning. <laughs> oh, God, you don't know how true that is. But thank you for watching, Joey, and thank you for submitting that. Now that we're at the end of the video, I would like to say I'm sorry this episode is as late as what it is, but last week was really hectic. And as many of you already know, my father-in-law tested positive for coronavirus at Thanksgiving. And last week, we discovered that my mother-in-law tested positive as well. But because of everyone's thoughts and prayers, they're doing a lot better now. So Carrie and I would like to say thank you for just keeping us in thought. And also, as many of you know, my mother had taken her dogs outside last week where the dogs were attacked by a neighboring dog. And one of her pets was able to come home as soon as they left the vet because there was just minor injury. However, the other one had to stay at the vets because her injuries were a lot worse. But once again, thanks to thoughts and prayers, we're able to finally bring her home tomorrow. So thank you so very much for thinking of us. And I would also like to say thank you to Lisa G. and J.L. Mulvihill, which J.L. Mulvihill is a young adult fantasy author, and you can purchase her books in ebook, print, and audiobook, so be sure to check her out. And if you're wondering why I'm giving a shout out to these wonderful people, it's because they have been able to contribute to my Patreon account. And if you would like to contribute as well, for $5 a month, I'll give you a shout out. 
And if you have a certain profession you would like to tie to your name, I'll tie that to your name as well. And for $10 a month, I'll give you that same shout out, but I'll also send you over a monthly photo because I do creepy photography on the side. And if you would like to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok, links for all of those are available in the description section as well, so be sure to hit me up. And if you have yet to subscribe to this channel, be sure to subscribe and hit that notifications bell because I have more book reviews coming in the near future. So until we see each other again, I hope you have a great week and sweet nightmares.